Hey, what's up, Meta Church? I want to start with a question today. Do you guys remember that old kind of nursery rhyme, like the sticks and stones? You know what I'm talking about, right? That thing about helping you like stand resiliently and like be a tough guy when you're getting bullied. You know how it goes, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will what? Words will never hurt me. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, apparently, I don't know if you know this, but I did some research. Apparently, that thing, that rhyme, or I don't know what you would call it, uh, poem, maybe, uh, that thing came out like in as early as 1820. There's like recorded, like our, our version of it, I should say, was recorded in human history like in the 1820s. I don't know why it came out. I don't know who came out with it. I don't know what kind of was the purpose of the campaign. But all I remember is that in my childhood, it felt like every adult everywhere was trying to get us to memorize that thing, to recite that thing, to repeat it up, down, backwards, forwards, and just kind of remind ourselves like, hey, you can say this if someone says something mean to you, so some, someone says something kind of harsh to you or they're bullying you. You can say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, words actually do hurt, right? Like what we realize as adults, as I've gone through counseling myself, as I've pastored and counseled other people, what I realize and what I know is that words actually do hurt. Like words sting, words linger, words like have a deep effect and toil on people. Um, and, and, and not only do they hurt, but what people say and the things they say can actually linger for a much longer time than necessary, even if it's not something that's hurtful or consequential. Like it just sticks. I'll give you an example of this. So recently someone uh, commented on one of our social clips that we put out, you know, like the little sermon clips that we'll put out on Instagram, YouTube, uh, YouTube TikTok, whatever. Uh, we, you know, put one out and recently someone commented um, by taking um, a, a verse out of Leviticus, mindly, mind you, uh, taking it out of context to comment like, looks like you have a tattoo and you, and, and, and uh, good luck with that, you know, and puts this verse from Leviticus like, Okay, that was literally for Levite priests, like Levites who were Israelites, of which I am neither, nor am I a priest. So therefore, that thing was explicit back then. Whatever, we don't need to get into the nuance of it. But I just thought like it's so stupid and then someone else commented back and you know how like comments are and like social media. My advice to you, don't engage in a comment battle. I don't, you shouldn't, it's not worth your time not worth the headache, but it was one of these silly things that inconsequential meant nothing to me as a stranger, who cares, whatever, no big deal. I saw it, but for whatever reason, it just lingered. Like, like for a couple of days, I was kind of like laughing at it, kind of thinking about it, like this is so weird that like that would be the thing that really bothers me. Like you have a tattoo, like, okay, cool. And so much so that you had to like write about it, but whatever, the words linger. And we've all experienced that, right? We've all experienced that where someone has said something and it might be hurtful, or where someone has said something and it might linger longer than we needed to. Um, and, and, and we understand that like words carry weight. Like there is significance in this. There is importance around this. And that's true, not only for the things that are said about us, not only about the things that are spoken of you or said about you, but this same effect occurs when people talk about other things, right? What they say, how they say it, when they say it, where they say it can often impact, influence, maybe even dictate what people or what you might believe about that thing, which like, you know, we're heading into a campaign season. It's why you hear about all this stuff about misinformation, right? And the importance of making sure things are fact-checked and, and where those sources of information are coming from, because it's too easy or too quickly, um, like we're too inclined to like just take something and those words stick and it can change a whole perception of what someone believes about someone or something or some place. And then I say all that because from time to time, I'll hear something that kind of does this same thing. I'll, hear, I'll, I'll come across something or I'll see something or I'll hear someone say something to the effect of like, yeah, like, well, what good is the church anyway? Like what, what role, like, like the church does no good. Like what role does it play in society? Like why is it even, like they should tax the church. They should shut them down. Maybe even on an extreme case, they're like the church does more harm in society or more harm for our culture than it does good. And I'll hear people say things like that. Now, to be clear, most of this kind of jargon or most of this kind of like, you know, language or people saying these kind of things, it's coming on, you know, um, like this chatter tends to happen like on some online forum or the comments section of a video or maybe some angry podcast. Like it's not often that you hear from like reputable or, or people that are respected um, socially, that is. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, but, but it still happens and it's still, um, comes um, to light. And, and regardless of, of, of who's saying it, it just feels like there's kind of like people are more inclined to like question or, or, or lay doubt or suspicion on the validity of the church. 
regardless if it's someone of credibility or not, it just feels like across our society, across our culture, I don't know if you feel this way, I certainly feel this way, that it seems like more people are inclined to like say, nah, it's not real, or that's like, you know, whatever, that's cute, that's not impactful, that's not meaningful, like that's not valid or that's not significant. And when I hear that, I'll be honest with you, when I hear that, like it irks me in like a significant way, like it it bothers me, not in like a, I need to defend the church, I need to defend God sort of way, but in a way that's like, man, like this is so misguided. Like, cause when someone says that, I think number one, like that person, like they really, when they say like, well, the church has no place in society or they should shut them down or like the churches like do more harm than good. Like, I don't really think they're actually thinking through like the full string or the full ramifications of what they're saying. And secondly, suggesting that the church has no role or no impact other than anything negative, that it doesn't have any positive influence or impact on society is just completely misinformed and factually false. Factually false. I mean, maybe you've heard those kind of things yourselves. Maybe you've heard your friends or your family members or your coworkers or your colleagues. Maybe, you know, we were talking about this um, whole idea of saying, I love my church. Maybe you've been afraid to say, I love my church because you're afraid that someone finds out and they're going to like question and make you say, well, that's stupid. Why would you do that? The church does this. They're greedy. They're money hungry. They're manipulators. They're this, they're, and, that, and you hear all that stuff kind of come right back up. And so maybe you've felt that same way. Maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've seen um, those social clips online. Maybe you've heard people talk about it. Maybe you've listened to the podcast. Um, uh, Maybe you feel like me when you hear those things, it just kind of irks you. Maybe for you, you're kind of a bit skeptical and you're here and you're watching and you're connected and you're like engaging, but you, you feel like you do question like, well, like maybe there's something more to this or maybe there's, you know, I'm not like gonna fully throw myself in here because, um, you know, there. I don't know what to make of the church. I don't know, like, like if this is really kind of like a good thing on the whole. Well, regardless of how you feel, I think you're in for a treat. Regardless of how you feel, I'm glad that you're here. Regardless of how you feel, whether you align with me, whether you align on the other side, whether you're somewhere in between, whether you're unsure of what to even make of this whole topic, you're in for a treat today because what I want to do today, what I want to show you is I want to highlight a few societal uh, values, maybe not even values, societal virtues, things that we understand as integral and key and essential as part of our society that trace their roots back to the early church and specifically trace their roots back to Jesus. In fact, these virtues that we hold and that we value dearly within our own culture, I'm talking about here in the United States and many parts of the world, these things are Christocentric or Christocentric, meaning they originated in Jesus and they've been exemplified and modeled by the church. And what I want to do today is I want to show you I want to walk you through it. And, 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 you know, I'm not really like this apologetics guy. I'm not like this guardian of like the scriptures or anything like that. But I do want to equip you and I do want to empower you so that in case you do hear or you do see or you do come across an instance where someone is questioning the validity of the church or making it sound like the church is wasteful or making it sound like the church has no point or making it sound like the church just does more harm than good that should you ever find yourself in that situation, and maybe it makes you question and wonder about your own beliefs or your own orientation or your own alignment with the church, that you have something you can kind of hang your hat on and say, yeah, that's why the church matters. Yeah, that's why the church is important. Yeah, this is what I'm stepping into. This is what I'm embracing. This is why I love my church. So I want to equip you with these things, and I want you to know that these things, what we'll find, were not only introduced by the church, but in the 2,000 years since then, they've been amplified, shaped, and continue to be perpetuated by the church. And so I'm going to start with virtue number one, which is simply this, community. Community. Now, last week, I preached the message on the power of our community here at Meta Church. But what I'm speaking to here is not necessarily like our church community. I'm speaking on a macro level, like kind of zoomed out, like the importance and the significance of community. Like I shared last week and we're talking about today, we place a significant value on community. I mean, it's no secret that our society, that our culture matter or cares deeply about social community. I mean, you don't have to look very far, but have you noticed over the last few years, kind of the uptick and the increase in inclusion and and, and bringing people in and how our culture has trended toward inclusivity in recent years? I mean, we're talking about something that not too long ago, like literally 10 years ago, like brands and companies and places were celebrated for their exclusion. And now we're talking about inclusion of all kind. 
people of all groups, people of all races, people of all sizes, people of all orientations, people of all ethnicities, all of it, our culture has been fostering this culture and, and, and society of like inclusion, ultimately of community, that everyone should belong here, that everyone has a place, that everyone has a home. But listen, this ideal, this virtue or this value of community that we are kind of propagating or that is being kind of pushed to us and maybe pushed on us in some cases, but this whole idea of, of community Listen, I want you to know we shouldn't resist it because this actually originated in Jesus. In fact, what we value today has not always been the case or has not always been, that's not the way things have always been. In fact, when you go back in Jesus' day, people were separated and segmented by hierarchy and socioeconomic class, gender, race, age, nationality, education. I mean, they were broken down and separated and segmented in just about every way possible. There was no such thing as everyone belongs. There was no such thing as like, hey, you have a place here. It was like, who are you? Where are you from? How old are you? What do you know? What don't you know? What language do you speak? What position? Who were you born to even? And then all of that was used to work against you, to leverage something against you. In fact, in Jesus's day, the, the hierarchy of society was, was, was kind of broken down in this way. You had people who were at the top, the gods, demigods even, people who were believed to be human and God. And then you had kings and rulers and leaders. And then you had like aristocrats and like, you know, educated or priests, the religious kind of caste or arc. Then underneath them, you had like peasants and day workers. Underneath them on the totem pole of like human hierarchy, you had women. And then at the bottom, you had children. And in every society, there was some form of governance in this way where you were split and broken up into any and every which group. But somehow with Jesus, somehow around Jesus, people of all ethnicities, people of all ages, people of all demographics, people from all walks of life, people from differing parts of life came together to follow Jesus and to connect with Jesus. Wealthy, poor, educated, rich, um, broken, uneducated, male, female, child, adult, sinners, religious alike. All of these people, when you read the Gospels, when you flip through these pages, what you find is that all of those people and many more actually came and found their place and found their community in and around and amongst Jesus and his followers. I mean, I say this all the time, but people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. People who were nothing like Jesus, liked Jesus. You see, from Jesus' perspective, there wasn't black or white, rich or poor, smart or dumb, educated, uneducated, wealthy or, or peasant. There was simply holy and sinful. All people fell into this category, either holy or sinful. And listen, that puts all of humanity on one side, the wrong side. All of us are sinful. And so in Jesus' world and in Jesus' life and his time, this is where the good news lies, is that Jesus said, I'm stepping into this and I'm bridging the gap between holy and sinful. And everyone can be redeemed. Everyone can be remade. Everyone can find a home. Everyone can belong. Everyone can have community. And he stepped into our world and proved it, right? John 3, 16, this is what Jesus said about himself. Very familiar verse, but think of it in this context of Jesus stepping into the world. He said, for this is how God loved the world, not one race, not one class, not one caste, not one age group. The world, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone, not someone, not a few, not this particular group, not that particular group, but everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You see, Jesus made it so that someone like me could stand here and be in the room with someone like you, despite our differences, despite our backgrounds, and despite the disparity between where you are and where I'm at or where you've been and where I've been, Jesus made it so that people like us and those around you could gather together, could be motivated, inspired, compelled, and find community in a place together. And his followers would then take this message and spread it across the world and start a movement we now know as the church and find places or foster places of belonging and community where anyone and everyone could step in. And listen, the church today continues to be that. There are very few places in society where you can literally come in as you are, but the church is one of them. 
There are very few places where you can come in with all sorts of baggage, where you can come in with all sorts of success and victory. There's very few places where you can come in and sit in a room where the disparity couldn't be greater and yet find acceptance and community than like that of the church. Does this mean we get it right all the time? Does this mean the church gets it right all the time or that a handful of churches get it right all the time? No, not at all. Because we're human. Because we're made up of humans from different backgrounds, different places, different walks, different screw-ups, different mess-ups, different mistakes, different visions, different heart, different passions. And yet somehow we still come together. Somehow we still form a community. And for every church that maybe gets this wrong, for every church that messes this up, there are countless others aspiring to get it right. There's so many others not just meta church, but so many others, an innumerable amount of churches who are committed to continuing to foster places of community because that's what Jesus did, welcoming anyone and everyone to belong, to be a part of it. And because of that, it motivates them toward this second virtue, which is dignity. Dignity. Now, if you were to do a word search, type in the word dignity into Google, you would find that there are over 300, get this, over 374 million, 374 million search results. This is actually up, believe it or not, this is actually up from 127 million search results just five years ago in 2019. Today, 374 million search results. Take it a step further, and if you type in dignity as a human right, what you will find is that there are nearly 195 million search results populated. Again, up from 109 million just five years ago in 2019. So what we see and what we understand, not just as a society, but as a world, is that human dignity is something that most, if not all of us, would agree is universal that humans have inherent dignity. They are born with this dignity. They have this dignity. I can't give you dignity just like you can't give me dignity. I was born with it and you were born with it. That is almost universally agreed upon, certainly in our society, but throughout the majority of the developed world. And this is fascinating because again, in Jesus' day, this was not the case. This is not how things operate. Again, in Jesus' day, there was a clear cast. I outlined it for you, right? You had like the gods or like the demigods. Then you had like the kings. Then you had like the aristocrats and the the religious priests um, and and artisans um, and merchants underneath them. Then you had like peasants and day workers. Then you had women underneath that. And then you had children beneath them. There was a clearly defined caste system in place. And to be fair, it worked, quote unquote. The caste system worked. It worked for that society and what they wanted it to do and what they wanted it to achieve. And within this hierarchy of kings or gods, kings, um, aristocrats and priests, artisans, then peasants and day laborers, then women, within that hierarchy, only the very top had dignity. The gods, the kings, and maybe the aristocrats, maybe the priests. And so it's fascinating when you think about Jesus because he was born into this world in a sheep stall. He was born in a manger. He was born in the side potentially of a cave, you know, where where animals were held. He was born without dignity. But it wasn't just that he was born without dignity. Think about the way he died, crucified and killed, dying a sinner's death, being mocked and humiliated. He died without dignity. So he was born without dignity. He died without dignity. But it wasn't his birth, nor was it his death that brought human dignity. It was everything he did in between. It was the way he lived his life from his birth to his death. That's what gave people dignity. That's what demonstrated and revealed and showed that all people have dignity. See, it was how Jesus invited children of the bottom rung to come and spend time with him, to be around him. It was how he elevated and lifted up women who were thrown down in shame and ridiculed and mocked and harassed and abused and how he elevated them and spoke purpose into them. It was how he engaged with the sick and the lepers and those who were deemed untouchable and unclean and unworthy of being around the public. Jesus would heal them. Jesus would touch them. He would place his hands upon them. It was how he was unwilling, get this, unwilling to show partiality to kings, rulers, and political figures or religious leaders because he was unwilling to compromise the message of the gospel and the truth and the reality that all people are in need of repentance, that all people are in need of a savior 
Savior. And at the same time, all people are worthy of dignity. That is how dignity became something that was common and taken hold of and became public and now become universally agreed upon. It started in Jesus and with Jesus. So much so, the way that he lived his life was so influential that his own brother, James, okay, who didn't believe in Jesus, think about that for a moment who didn't come to faith in Jesus until after the crucifixion and the resurrection, James, the brother of Jesus, wrote this to the church in James 1.27. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Did you catch that? James was speaking of dignity. He says, you want to know, you want to follow Jesus, you want to be religious, you want to have zeal in your faith? then care for the undignified, care for those who are deemed unworthy, care for the untouchables, care for the least of these. And Jesus is the one who gave people their dignity and he created the notion that all people have dignity. And it was the church that took this idea from Jesus, what they saw exemplified in the way that he lived his life day in and day out. And the church took it and said, hey, we need to model this. This is the way of Jesus. All people have dignity. And so whether it's the widow, whether it's the child, whether it's the poor, whether it's the wealthy, whoever it is, we need to care for them. We need to love them. We need to serve them. We need to reach them. And they brought, or began putting this dignity into practice or living with this dignity at the forefront of their minds each and every single day. So it was community, it was dignity. But here's another virtue that we value today and yet finds its roots and the evidence of it and it's been amplified through the church and that would be charity. Charity, now charity is a word that we don't necessarily use in our common vernacular or things that we speak of or the way that we talk day in and day out, but it's something that we all know very well. Charity by definition or to be charitable is to be helpful to those who are in need. It's to um, offer assistance to those who are suffering. That is the, the actual definition of charity. And we've all been on the receiving end of charity. We've all experienced that. We've all been benefited by that. When someone else's kindness kind of blesses you, when someone else's kindness kind of overwhelms you, or when someone does something they sacrifice for you, or they do something kind in the midst of your plight, in the midst of your struggle, or in the midst of your challenge, or during a time of need, you've experienced that and you know how much and how significant and how impactful that person's charity was to you in that moment. So we know how much of a difference charity makes and how much of an impact it has on our own lives. Not only that, but we're inspired when we see acts of charity. Someone drops their grocery bags and someone stops in the middle of a busy street to pick it up and help them or carry something for them. You know, some, a simple act like that, or we see someone um, doing something kind for the unhoused or the homeless. But, but even stretching beyond that, right? When we think of like doctors and, 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 and medical professionals who are going into war-torn areas like Palestine right now or the Ukraine, and they're foregoing vacations and paychecks and time with their family and their loved ones to go and meet the needs of people who are suffering, people who are wounded, people who are hurting, and they're trying to provide care and supply. And we're inspired by those acts of charity or that person that we know who volunteers their time on a Friday or a Saturday. And before they go out and do anything else, they're over there feeding the unhoused or feeding the homeless, or they're over there providing needs and meeting material needs and physical needs for those that are suffering or struggling. And we say, man, that act of charity inspires us. It's just kind of charity and action is that. That it is so inspiring. But what you need to know is that prior to Jesus and prior to the church, charity was far from the standard of human interaction. Charity was not something that the people did or partook in or, or, or recognized. In fact, one of the maybe most kind of startling um, practices and Roman civilization was the practice of exposure. And the practice of exposure was simply this. Two people um, engage in intimacy and leads to ultimately one person getting pregnant and having a child. And so the practice of exposure allowed for, in Roman provinces, it allowed for that parent to take their child and leave them outside, not like outside their apartment, but to a like designated place where they would leave that newborn child if they didn't want that child, they could leave that child there for seven days. And over the course of that seven days, they would just leave them out in the wild. And if they returned after seven days and that child was still alive, they were required to keep the child. But if that child had died over the course of those seven days, then it was deemed that the gods desired for that child, that fate or the gods or whoever decided that that child was 
never meant to be. Hence the idea or the name exposure. You were exposing your child or that child to the elements and seeing kind of like, hey, we'll see what happens. This was common and standard practice in Roman civilization. In fact, there's a couple of scripture verses that actually speak to it or insinuate the practice of exposure taking place. But, but do you know what the early Christians did? The early Christians recognizing and seeing the, the, the kind of grotesque nature of this practice decided that what they would do is they would go to those designated places and they would take in those children. They would orphan them. They would foster them and they would raise them up as their own. They would give them a loving home or a loving environment. And that is how we have modern day orphanages is because Christians took initiative and said, no, this is unjust. This is wrong. And so I'm going to do something favorable or something kind or something generous for those who are suffering, those who are struggling. You know, we have hospitals all over the United States. We have hospitals all over the world. But do you realize the first hospital didn't come into human existence until around 372 AD? But guess what? Guess who started it? It was two Christian brothers. It was two brothers who recognized the need to care for the sick. The, to, to, and they started studying medicine and starting, uh, studying practices to, to help heal people and bring people back to a place of healing. Basil of Caesarea and Gregory of Nyssa started this thing together and they instituted the very first hospital in human history to care for the sick, to care for the unwell, and to to rehabilitate them back to full health. All of this was initiated by Christians. Why did they do this? Why were they so concerned? Because Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 25, very plainly, very simply, Jesus spoke and he said, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Jesus said, we are called to be a people known for our charity, known for the things that we do. And the charity that Jesus showed the world some 2,000 years ago has motivated Christians for over 2,000 years to continue to meet the needs of others in their times of distress, in their times of suffering, and in their times of struggle. Even today, even today, the United States, um, um, in the United States alone, I should say, um, Christians and church-going Christians specifically volunteer nearly 56 million hours annually outside of their church. In the United States today, Christians volunteer over 56 million hours annually outside of their church. Now think about that for a moment. That number doesn't tally or include those who are serving on Sundays, those who are a group leader. Like this is all outside of their church. Now you may not know this, but today the US government values volunteer hours at an estimated $28 and change per hour. Now I try to do the math on my calculator, but the phone calculator doesn't go that high. And so that's a lot of money in terms of if you were to equate it or translate it into money, that's a lot of contribution that is given out of charity that Christians today are making a difference. Not only that, statistically speaking, Christians are much more likely to volunteer and to serve and to do acts of charity than those who are non-church going, not just non-church going Christians, but non-church going in general. Those who are actively engaged in the church are inclined to serve and to volunteer at a much higher level than those who are not actively engaged in the church. So we see the impact that Christians are having today that the church has today. And then one of the maybe kind of pivotal reasons why, foundational reasons why, is this fourth virtue of humility. Humility. You know, when, when I think about why Christians are motivated to do the things they do, when they, it, it, it's, it's all born out of humility. That God is God, he's the greatest, and he is worthy of being served. And so if I serve out of my community, if I serve at my church, if I serve at this um, homeless shelter, if I serve at this children's shelter, if I serve with this nonprofit, like if I volunteer in this area, like it's just a way of recognizing that God is bigger than me, that God is greater than me. And that is born out of a place of humility. And I think one of the interesting things about our culture is that we certainly like it when we look at bosses or, or leaders or even politicians and, and there's an aspect of them that, that communicates or conveys humility. When we see humility in these leaders, we value that and we desire it and we, and, and we, we acknowledge like that's a good thing. That's a great thing. I, I mean, me personally, I don't know if you can, but I, can, you, can you think of anything more maybe annoying 
or problematic than like an incredibly arrogant and proud and prideful boss or an incredibly arrogant and proudful leader or an incredibly proud or arrogant politician, an incredibly arrogant or proud pastor? No, of course not. And in fact, today we think of humility as something that is noble, something that is honorable. It's a desirable characteristic. We, we, we want that and we seek that in the people that we want to follow. So much so that if someone lacks humility, we're able to recognize like that's a problem, like that's not right. But again, I don't need to tell you this, this wasn't always the case. The world that Jesus stepped into, this did not exist. Humility was not something that was celebrated or praised or desired. In fact, it was often considered a weakness. To be called humble was almost to kind of be like an, like an offensive kind of name that was slapped on someone. And in a sense, it was like a derogatory word. What you wanted was title. What you wanted was status. What you wanted was position. What you wanted was honor. What you wanted was power. Now, to be clear, there are plenty of people today that that's what they want. But again, it proves my point. When we see that it's distasteful, I think, nah, that's not right. When the world sees it, they think it's distasteful. They think it's not right. See, the goal back then was to be the greatest, not to be the lowest. But when Jesus came, he flipped the script, right? He inverted this pyramid and, and, he, and he said these words in Matthew 20, 26, but among you, it will be different. Among you, among his followers, among the church, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Because of Jesus and the way that he lived his life and the way that he instructed, greatness actually became a race to the bottom, not to the top. And so his followers and the church began living and practicing and doing, taking oaths of humility to abide and follow the way of Jesus more accurately, to live like Christ, to reflect Christ, and to demonstrate the attitude of Christ in all of their ways. And the church today continues to be that. There are things that people will say, there are things that people will do, and oftentimes, more often than not, in fact, almost all of the time, things that people will say and do against the church. And what does the church do? How does the church respond? with humility. They turned the other cheek, just like Jesus taught. Rather than fighting back, rather than suing, rather than finding a, filing a counter lawsuit for libel or, or, or something like that, the church oftentimes just takes the humble position. And I'm talking about society at large, and I know specific instances where churches were within their legal right to respond or to retaliate in some way. And instead they took the high road, which is the low road to be humble, to become the least of these, recognizing that's who Jesus has called us to be. And I think in our society, what we see is that there are Christians, there are churches who continue to model this and it doesn't get celebrated because that's not the goal of humility. It's not, hey, everyone, look, I'm super humble because that would be arrogant. Hey, everyone, look at me. Look how, you know, look at the humility that I carry myself with. That's not what we're interested in. That's not what we're motivated by. The church and Christians are motivated by the things Jesus said and the way he lived. And we seek to replicate and do that and follow that in the same way. And so you see these four words. You have community, there's dignity, there's charity, and then ultimately humility. Four virtues that are incredibly valuable in our society that are deemed and regarded in high esteem Virtues that we say matter, that are integral to what we do, how we operate, how we function as a society. But virtues that were introduced by Christ, amplified by the church, and they continue to be defined and redefined by the way Christians and the church today live and model and act. So if you ever find yourself in a situation or in a place where someone's questioning or where someone is, you know, raising suspicion or casting doubt on something. I don't think you need to defend it. I don't think you need to engage in an argument of any kind. If someone's asking you, you can certainly speak to it. But more than anything, what I wanna to do today is I wanna equip you with this confidence to know, yeah, the church does matter. The church has an integral place in our society. In fact, were it not for the church, our society would not even be what we think it is today. And it's up to us, the church, some 2000 years later, after Jesus introduced these things, brought awareness and elevated us to a higher understanding, it's up to us some 2,000 years later 
to carry these things forward, to continue defining and redefining and demonstrating and showing and revealing to the world around us what these things and other things that Jesus said, what they look like, how they impact the culture and the world we live in, and why it matters today. So Meta Church, listen, I wanna pray for us as we close, but the next time you hear someone diminishing, questioning, second guessing, again, no need to argue, no need to retaliate, but know in your heart and know in your mind and know in your spirit, the church matters. And I've got good news for you. We're not going anywhere. The church is here to stay. Jesus promised it, Jesus declared it, Jesus spoke it. And so it's up to us to reflect his heart, his desire, and his vision for the church. So with that, let me pray for you, and then I'll turn it back over to the team here for worship. God, we thank you for your church. We thank you for its impact. We thank you for the vision that you have. We thank you for the direction that you have over the church and the way you've led the church over these past 2,000 years to influence, shape, and reshape culture and society at large. Lord, we know that you're already doing that, that you are, not already, but that you are continuing to do that even now as we stand before you. So Lord, may you continue to invigorate our heart, our passion, our vision for the church. May we see what you see. May we operate as you've envisioned. And may we continue to impact the world around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.